If you're going to live on board, why not come over to the dark side and be a continuous cruiser? That's what it says in the window of one of my uh, friend's boats. And there is an element of stepping outside the normal society if, you, uh, if you're attracted to the water by the nomadic lifestyle cruising from place to place. But what are the benefits and the pitfalls? Well, there are some people, lots of them, who live on a boat and never want to move. Others may be unable to stray far from wherever they have a job or a family. But for many liverboards, being able to go on tour for at least a substantial part of the year is a vital part of the charm of the lifestyle. As you cast off, you're about to become a water gypsy, someone with a nomadic lifestyle, as the dictionary puts it. Now, personally, I revel in the idea of being different and outside the normal, tedious regulations of land-based life. Despite the frustrations and the annoyances from supercilious boaters to suspicious CRT officials, the life of a continuous cruiser is largely free from stress. Most of the time is spent exploring new or old places, enjoying nature in an up-close and personal way, or meeting wonderful people in unexpected places and circumstances. Now, some personal highlights of the last couple of years alone have been getting together with old friends at boating festivals on the Grand Union and making some wonderful new friends as we, we travel together. I've sat on my cruiser stern watching a, king, a kingfisher plucking small fry from the Shropshire Union above Adderley Locks and gazed with admiration at the, uh, the high shapes of soaring pairs of buzzards as I puttered along the North Oxford. I've been soaked to the skin through several supposedly waterproof layers of clothing and burned to a sort of semi-permanent ruddiness by baking sun and brisk winds. Much of my itinerant life is outdoors and that, that satisfies the, the country lad inside me. It's nine years, ten years now since I've lived afloat and I'm still learning the best way to get the most from a fabulous lifestyle. Over those years I've been slowly learning not to be stressed, even by the inconsiderate, the bigoted and the arrogant of both water and land. I'm still trying. Uh, you know, for us the term water gypsy is a romantic way of describing our lifestyle, but gypsies are different from the common herd and there are some who choose to use it as a term of abuse about continuous cruises. I have to say that both Canal and River Trust and some leisure boaters are at best ambivalent about those of us who live afloat, and especially those of us that use the canal system all year round. Every now and again, seeing a Canal River Trust floats the idea of charging continuous cruisers a premium on the basis that they use the system more, only to be ridiculed by those who point out that uh, the system should be accessible to everyone year round in any event, and that the slow, relaxed travelling pace of the liverboard is far less damaging to canal banks and locks than the private leisure boats, share boats and hire boats determined to rush around a ring or a route to a fixed schedule. I make the point simply because the experience of most liverboards is that they are envied by the majority of other boaters but regarded as second-class citizens by a few. So why is that? Earlier this year, Rex Walden, then chair of the excellent Residential Boat Owners Association, which I would urge everybody, every liverboard to join, said we need to steer away from the view that the waterways are a playground for well-heeled retired folk or a paradise for dropouts. In doing so, he touched on that ambivalence about liverboards. Anyone who travels our system will have some will have come across both the well-heeled and new boats who have decided to spend summers living afloat, whilst retreating in winter to their villa in 
some country with more sunshine. Equally, there are a substantial number of people, sometimes families with young children, living on older vessels, whilst they attempt to improve or upgrade them. Pensioners, often on fixed incomes, have opted for the lifestyle in increasing numbers as a way of making their, their money go as far as possible. And most of us fall somewhere between the two, but we get the best out of our travels by being tolerant and accepting all the varied lifestyles of those who live on our waterways. So as a result of that sort of point of view, I've met some fascinating people with tales to tell that go far beyond their appearance or that of their vessel. Now we'll, we'll deal with permanent moorings later, but those who decide to cruise the system still have to deal with the issue of moorings in various ways. There is the question of how long you want to stay in one place before moving on. For most of us that will vary. You may want two or three weeks in uh, London to see all the, all the sights, but only a couple of hours outside a, a convenient canal side supermarket. Whatever your needs, you're likely to have to deal with the issue of enforcement of the mooring rules at the particular sites. Now, despite uh, Canal and River Trust's national remit, the reality on the bank is there are no hard and fast rules and methods that apply across the country. Once in the southern part of the country, you were likely to come across mooring wardens, boaters who'd been given official permission to, uh, to set up a permanent mooring and were paid by Canal and River Trust to ensure everyone else stuck to the rules on that particular mooring site. They've gone now. London has tightened up considerably in recent years and uh, it's now quite commonplace to suspend the licences of boaters who don't move enough or stay too often in one place. It's different elsewhere. North of Braunston, um, the CRT officials are much keener to enforce the rules insisting on continuous cruising, uh, cruisers moving more substantial distances and that they don't come back for much longer periods of times. But almost everywhere you go, you'll come across some boats that seem immune to those rules, whatever they may be. One of the big failures of um, Canal and River Trust has been to over-enforce difficult rules in some places and under-enforce them in others. You'll always come across people who have, will tell you that that boat or the other boat has been allowed to stay for years on 14-day um, moorings. And in other areas, uh, they've set up mooring times based on what the local people want, not the local boaters. Other places Popular moorings are more designed for the holiday maker and the boat hire than the continuous cruiser. Of course, we know that Canal and River Trust is on difficult legal ground in enforcing any time limit shorter than the universal 14-day restriction, and we know that it doesn't have the staff to police those mooring limits that it does advertise. It comes to the winter and the there's the question of whether you should tie up in one place and pay CRT for the privilege of being ignored or move on. I mean, the, the boom in build, marina building means there's lots of winter mooring spaces in marinas. Um, you may well pay £200 a month for a 60-foot boat, but that can be cheaper than paying CRT to stay on the bank. I don't know, it depends on whether you want to spend months gazing at other boats, I suppose, in the winter. It's too much for many of the free spirits who live aboard, even if you do get an electrical hookup. They would prefer to be on the bank, and most of them tend to avoid CRT's plans to make a bit of extra money by setting up winter moorings. I've never understood how the Trust can just justify charging hundreds of pounds a month in some locations 
for the privilege of mooring on visitor moorings, which you're entitled to moor on for 14 days anyway, sometimes without a water supply or a facility block within miles. And many liverboard boaters get quite upset about those who agree to pay up for the sake of being in one place. That makes it difficult for the rest, they argue. Uh, and it enables the CRT to, in effect, penalise continuous cruisers for not moving at a time when getting around the system is next to impossible because of winter stoppages. Whatever the rights and wrongs, it, it certainly seems to uh, be greedy to charge nearly the same as a marina berth and offer nothing in return. Now, living afloat without a permanent mooring is not difficult until you come into contact with officialdom. Dealing with the NHS is an issue for many and some simply hang on to the GP they had last time living ashore, even if it means travelling hundreds of miles uh, to pick up prescriptions and things. Even if you have to have a, an M if you, if you have to have a GP on shore, it can be difficult getting prescriptions from them in, in any event. It's always possible to go to the nearest GP with a copy of your repeat prescription, sign in as a temporary patient and ask them to issue a new one. The same applies if you're sick or injured. If you're on the move and don't have a shore base, it's probably sensible to register with a GP in a town where you have easy access from the canal system and in an area where you're most likely to be over the winter period, where you're not moving so much. Most flexible NHS practices will allow you to register using a post restant address of a nearby post office or even the address of the surgery itself. It's best to explain that you live on a boat and ask if they could phone you with anything urgent. If you're really lucky, you'll get one like ours who will allow you uh, to send them a stamped and addressed envelope uh, with a repeat prescription and that way um, it can be returned to the nearest post office wherever you happen to be. You can pick it up and get it filled. If you want a bus pass now, life gets a bit more complicated. You need an address, you see, for that, or at least you need to be on the electoral register. One way is to go into the local council and ask. I found one that was particularly helpful. They explained that I needed to be on the electoral register to get a bus pass. I was then sent to meet two slightly embarrassed ladies in the electoral registry office who explained that Although they knew we lived on a boat, um, the only way they could uh, put us on the register was if we declared ourselves officially homeless and stated that we had uh, a link with the local area. I think they expected us to be offended, but uh, we're accustomed to such nonsense and signed the official form giving the local post offices our post restaurant address. Once on the register, I could apply and the pass was in my hands in a couple of weeks. There are usually ways around the system and my advice is to be open and honest with officials, try to see them in person and to be ready for the idiotic rules that are only geared up to deal with land dwellers. It's unfortunate but that's the way it works. Just part of the fun of being a continuous cruiser. <laughs>